All right, this is section 4.7, and it's going to cover inverse trig functions. And uh, you might be asking where did 4.5 and 4.6 go? Well, we're skipping them for now, but I promise, trust me, we will come back to them. Now, I want to just remind you the whole idea of what inverse functions are, and then we'll talk about what inverse trig functions are. Remember, inverse functions are simply functions where the output and the input get switched around, okay? So it's very simple. So let's talk about regular functions to start with, I guess, here. Um, for example, we know that the sine function takes inputs, right? It has inputs here. The inputs are angles, and the output that we get from a sine function is the um, y-coordinate from the unit circle. So the input is an angle. We usually refer to that as theta, maybe. And the output for sine is the y-coordinate. Now, if we're talking about a triangle, that would be uh, opposite over the hypotenuse. If we're talking about the not necessarily a unit circle, then it, the output would be the y over the r. We've talked about all that stuff. So, for example, if I said to you sine of 60 degrees is what? And so I'm giving you the input. I'm giving you 60 degrees. You're telling me the output for sine of 60 degrees is right here, radical 3 over 2. Very, very simple. Or I could say, what is cosine of 2 pi over 3? Cosine of 2 pi over 3. So here's the angle, 2 pi over 3. The output is the x coordinate. That's what cosine does. And we get negative 1 half. Now, the definition of a function is that every input has one output. For example, 60 degrees led us to pi over, or I'm sorry, radical 3 over 2. And that's it. The one, the input of 60 had one output. So every input has one output. That output might get repeated, but it's the key idea is that this input of 60 degrees led us to one output and one output only. There's not two answers to this. There's one answer to this. That's important to understand as well. So the idea of inverse trig functions is we take these outputs and inputs and we simply switch them, right? So the input becomes the output and the output becomes the input. Very, very basic. So now the input is the y-coordinate from the unit circle, and the output is the angle, okay? So um, let me scroll down here, and then we're going to come back to that unit circle in a second. Now, um, a way of mathematically looking at this is we have y equals sine of x. Now, remember here, x is the input. x is the input. And for us, that's an angle. And that could be actually any angle in the world. And the output for us here is y. And that represents um, a y-coordinate from the unit circle. Or again, it could be opposite over hypotenuse if we're dealing with the triangle. Or it could be y over r if we're not necessarily on the unit circle. Um, another example real quick here, I'll just kind of put to the side. We could also do y equals cosine of x. Now here, the input x is an angle, just like it was for sine. In the output, we're commonly use x's and y's for outputs, right? The output is the x coordinate from the unit circle. Okay, now some people say, wait a minute, why is there a y there if it represents the x coordinate from the unit circle? Well, that's just because in basic algebra, we refer to the outputs as y and the inputs as x. So for us, that input is an angle, we would call it theta normally, and the output y is an x coordinate from the unit circle and so forth. So anyway, the whole idea here is that when we're working with inverse functions, we switch the input and the output. So we have the x become the output and the y become the input. So the output is the angle and the input is the y coordinate from the unit circle. Same thing over here. Switch them up. x equals cosine of y. So now the output is the angle. The input, well for cosine the input is an x coordinate from the unit circle. Okay? Um, so now the, the issue is you know, if I just leave it like this, you still see sine. So we have to change it up a little bit. We have to just change how it looks. That way you understand that it's a sine inverse and not a regular sine. Because if I just put S-I-N, that's sine. We know that what a sine is. Sine is an input of an angle, output of the y coordinate. So we need to somehow signify that we're working with an inverse. And to do that, we use sine. And we put a little negative 1 right here. So that's sine inverse. Or we have cosine inverse. We just put a little negative 1 after the sine, after the cosine. So now a sine inverse, right? Again, remember, sine inverse takes in that y coordinate. 
and it gives out the angle theta. So again, I, ha I switched out my input and my output. So cosine inverse takes in that x-coordinate and spits out that angle. Okay? Or remember, sine inverse, if you're thinking about triangles, it would take in the opposite over the hypotenuse, and it would spit out the angle. Cosine inverse, if you're talking about triangles, would take in the adjacent over the hypotenuse and spit out the angle. Okay? So, um, this is pretty easy, except for one small problem, so let me explain. So, if I said to you, find sine inverse of one-half. Okay, so this is an inverse. So, my output is now my input, and my input is now my output. So, sine inverse, normally with sine, we see an angle right here. But no, with an inverse sine, remember sine inverses take in, for sine at least, the y coordinate from the unit circle. Because remember, the output and the input are switched. So I'm giving you the y coordinate. I'm asking for you to find what the angle is. So let's go back up to the unit circle, and I'm telling you that the y coordinate is one half. I'm asking for you to give me the angle. Well, I see that right here I have a y coordinate of one half, but the problem is I also see a y coordinate of one half over here. So that means I potentially have two different answers, 30 degrees, or pi over 6, and then 150 degrees, or 5 pi over 6. So that means that where do I see an y coordinate of one half? Well, I see that at 30 degrees but I also see that at 150 degrees. And this poses a huge problem for functions because functions are only allowed to have one output for the input. So I have my input here, and I, the problem is that I have two potential outputs. And I don't like that because now it's not, technically it's not a function. A function is only allowed one output. So what we do is we restrict sine inverse. We say that sine inverse is restricted to only looking from 0 to 90 or from 0 to negative 90. So for sine inverse, we're not allowed to look into quadrants 2 or quadrants 3. So that eliminates all these repeats, because if you notice, all the y-coordinates on this side of the graph, on this side of the graph, are the same as the y-coordinates on this side. So if we ignore this side, and we only restrict ourselves to looking at this side, then we could see that we will only be allowed to have one answer. So the answer to this question right here would be 30 degrees. The 150 would not be in our area that we're allowed to look. Okay? So let's do that again real quick. Let's try another one here. Where is si okay, sine inverse of negative radical 3 over 2? So once again, this is a sine inverse, so I'm remembering inverses flip the input and output. So now this is not an angle. This is a y-coordinate from the unit circle. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my unit circle. I'm going to look. Where do I see a y-coordinate of negative radical 3 over 2? Well, I see it happen right here and right here. But remember, we defined it specifically to only be in quadrants 1 or quadrant 4, either 0 to 90 or 0 to negative 90. We're not allowed to look over here. So that way we don't have this issue of two different possible answers. So that means my answer is right here. Now this angle is 300 degrees. Uh, however, notice for me to get to 300 degrees, I have to go through this area over here, which I'm not allowed to go through. So understand that for sine inverse, I'm allowed to go from 0 to 90 or 0 to negative 90. So this is where my answer is. This is where the y coordinate is negative radical 3 over 2. But to get there, I'd have to go negative 60. So my answer here would be negative 60 degrees, or I could give the, the negative pi over 3. Okay, I could say in radians. Remember, giving your answer in radians or degrees are just different, different units, that's all. So understand that I'm not allowed to say 330 because, or 300, because that would imply I go all the way around the circle, but I'm only allowed to go from 0 to 90 or 0 to negative 90. Okay? Now for, let's look at some problems here for cotangent.
So for, or for cosine, sorry. So cosine inverse of negative one half. Okay, so now remember, this is an inverse, and that's what this little negative one tells me. So I remember with inverses that I'm looking for an angle. I'm trying to find that angle that has an x value. How do I know x? Because that's what cosine is. An x value of negative one half. So I'm going to come up here. Where do I see an x value of negative one half? Well, I see it right here, and I see it right here. Well, that means there's two possible outputs, 120 degrees or 240 degrees. Well, I can't have two outputs because that's not a function. A function is only allowed one output. So for cosine, we restrict ourselves from 0 to 180 degrees. We don't look in quadrants 3 or 4. That is because, if you notice, x values from the top or, uh, quadrants 1 and 2 are repeated down the bottom quadrants 3 and 4. So we restrict ourselves to only looking at the top, which means that we wouldn't look here at all. We would only look right here for our answer, which would be 120 degrees. So my answer for cosine here, my only answer would be 120 degrees, or you could give the radian equivalent. So let's write that down here. So for sine inverse, we restrict ourselves from negative 90 to positive 90. Or you could say pi over 2, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So we're only restricted to looking at quadrants 1 and quadrants 4, the right hand side. For cosine inverse, we restrict ourselves to only looking from 0 to 180 degrees, or 0 to pi radians. And we could also be equal to those values as well. Okay? So that's because we're trying to avoid having multiple answers. Remember, it, functions are only allowed to have one output, not two. So let's lastly look at one more problem. Let me scroll down here. I've got some gray area there. That's okay. Let's look at one more problem. Here. Let's look at tangent inverse of radical 3. Uh, actually, let's make that negative radical 3. Okay, so remember, this is an inverse, so my output is an angle. I'm trying to find this angle. I don't know what this angle is, but I do know that the value, the y divided by the x value, would be negative radical 3. So I'm looking at my unit circle, where would the tangent value, which would be y divided by x, be negative radical 3? I'm trying to figure out where that happens. Well, it doesn't happen in quadrant 1, because that would be positive. Uh, in quadrant 2, ooh, wait a minute here, in quadrant 2, let's see here, right here, if I take my y divided by my x right here at 120 degrees, I would get negative radical 3, but guess what, it also happens right here. If I take my y divided by my x, I would get negative radical 3. Well, I can't have two outputs, I'm only allowed to have one. So for tangent, we also restrict ourselves from the quadrant 1 to quadrant 4, very similar to sine. That's because tangents are repeated in quadrant 1 and quadrant 3, positives and positives, and quadrants 2 and quadrant 4, negatives and negatives. So we restrict ourselves to only looking from 0 to 90 and 0 to negative 90. So that means my answer would be not 300, just like for sine. We can't go around to get there. We have to go down to get there. So my answer would be negative 60 degrees or negative pi over 3, just if I would do it in radians. So it's not a different answer, it's just a different unit. Um, so that's how it is for tangent. So remember, tangent is also defined from negative 90 degrees to positive 90 degrees. Now, we don't use the or equal to signs because, let's look up here real quick, hopefully this makes sense, at 90 degrees, tangent is undefined. At negative 90 degrees, down here, negative 90 degrees, tangent is also undefined, so that's why we don't include those values. So hopefully that's a real quick little rundown of inverse functions. We're going to talk a lot more in class about them and do a lot more with them, but hopefully that's a quick understanding of the whole idea of looking for inputs versus outputs and switching them around.